Coming up on this special live election episode of Political Pulse, it's been a crazy campaign trail leading to tonight as polls just closed. Michelle Wu has been in the lead. Will that translate into a win tonight or will there be an upset? Anissa Asabi George has been out on the campaign trail all day hoping for an upset. We'll be live at both headquarters tonight. Hello and welcome to Political Polls. On this special edition, we are looking at the end of the mayoral race and the campaign trails that brought us here. I'm Kerrigan Knowles. And I'm Annie Bennett. Now, let's take a look at how the candidates spent this election day. Michelle Wu spent the day hopping from polling place to polling place around the city, encouraging residents to get out and vote. Midday, Wu walked around Chinatown, saying she was overjoyed to see the energy at the polls. Wu went live on Instagram while on her way to a campaign event, taking a moment to thank her staffers. And I'm just so grateful for everyone who's been putting in the work. She was later joined by Mayor Kim Janey at her Blue Hill Avenue headquarters, where the two spoke about how the importance of voting mattered. Wu faced questions from voters and discussed how she felt leading up to today. Anissa Asabi George has fallen in the polls leading up to Election Day. Molly Doherty explained how Asabi George is trying to close the gap. South Boston helped Anissa Asabi George secure the second spot in the Boston mayoral election. Despite Michelle Wu's strong lead in tonight's election, according to recent Emerson polls, Asabi George is relying on areas like South Boston and her union endorsements to close the gap. Asabi George's no-nonsense campaign has attracted a strong following throughout Boston. Her endorsement lists big names, such as Massachusetts State Representative Kevin Honan and former Boston Police Commissioner William Gross. Topping those names, however, is the Massachusetts Nursing Association. The 23,000-member union says... Just as MNA nurses and healthcare professionals have always been on the front lines of healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, Anissa has long dedicated herself to improving public health by elevating and meeting the social, environmental, and emotional needs of all Boston residents. Neighborhoods like South Boston played a key role in delivering a second place primary victory to Anissa Isabi George. Residents here eagerly shared their thoughts leading up to the election. So I'm, a, I'm a union member, so somebody who supports the you know, union. I'm a bricklayer, a local three. Um, you know, masonry, the electricians, bricklayer, all the different trades. Someone who supports the trades. These groups have immense sway leading up to the election, but the ultimate decision comes down to voters tonight. From South Boston, I'm Molly Doherty. We have Faith Canal live at the Wu election party. What do you have for us, Faith? Hi, guys. I'm here right now. I'm Faith Pino. I'm reporting live from the Boston Center for the Arts. We're here right now currently waiting for Michelle Wu. The results are about 9% in with Wu currently leading above Asabi George. We've been entertained all night. We have some lovely music going on behind me. We have more entertainment coming up as we wait for Wu to arrive around 9, and we'll make sure to keep you guys posted. Thank you so much, Faith. Candidate Anissa Sabi George was up and at the polls bright and early to cast her vote in this election. Wearing her signature pink coat, she greeted voters outside of the polling place. Later in the day, she met with her mom and Labor Secretary Martyr Walsh's mom at a polling place in Dorchester as the mothers cast their own votes. A recent Emerson poll has Michelle Wu winning this mayoral election by over 30 points. And this is one of the areas that helped her win in the primary. Of course, we can never know the true results until later tonight when the election results come in. But it will be exciting to find out. In the primary election, Michelle Wu dominated in liberal-leaning precincts, including Chinatown, Austin Brighton, Jamaica Plain, Beacon Hill, and the Back Bay, and the South End. Anissa Asabi George, a Dorchester native, won with 49% of the vote in South Boston. I think that they recognize a lot in her um, as someone who's from the area in particular um, and probably uh, thought that she might represent them. 
Asabi George's base in South Boston and parts of Dorchester appeals to historically white conservative voters. Certain residents hope her Dorchester roots will allow the neighborhood to feel represented and heard within the city government. Uh, I do understand that different areas of Boston have different interests, right? Uh, do people want to drive in their cars or do they want to live in a car-free society, right? That depends on what neighborhood you live in. Um, what type of access to transportation you already have. Voters living in different parts of Boston have varying opinions on what issue should be the future mayor's top priority in the first 100 days. I live in uh, the town that's not really, you know, not as fancy as like South Boston or something. But I live in Dorchester, so food insecurities and like gun violence is like a big thing for my neighborhood. So her having that knowledge makes it a better reason I should vote for her when I get the chance. A recent Emerson College poll showed voters who did not participate in the primary election were split between Asabi George and Wu, 42 to 46 percent. The remaining 12 percent remain undecided. From Chinatown, I'm Ryan Nelson. So Asabi George has got a lot of work to do if she wants to catch up. Yeah, but I think that both candidates going out early and casting their votes like that, um, showing their support for their own candidate campaign really brings it up. All right, our reporter Molly Doherty is live at Nisa Asabi George's election headquarters now. What's happening, Molly? I just spoke with Nicole Caravella, communications director for Team Anissa, just moments ago. She said numbers are looking encouraging. Efforts this weekend made by Team Anissa to close the gap between Anissa and opponent Michelle Wu had a far overexpected turnout. This leads Caravella to believe it's going to be a long night watching results trickle in. Okay. Attracting young voters has become a priority for Wu and Asabi George. Peyton Kavanaugh tells us more. The election trail sure is heating up right now with just a week left before Boston chooses their next mayor. Early voting is well underway, and this week, Michelle Wu's team is working to get Bostonians excited to cast their ballots. Wu has been focused on driving up voter turnout after low numbers in last month's preliminary elections. At a kickoff event on Saturday at the Boston Public Library, Wu had the chance to connect with voters. She was joined in Back Bay early, at the early voting site by Senator Elizabeth Warren. An avid supporter of Wu, Warren echoed the campaign's calls for change. Early voting ends October 29th. Until then, the Wu team gears up for a week of door knocking as they hope to engage eligible voters. Following a weekend of campaigning, Wu hit the debate stage on Monday night. She squared up against opponent Anissa Asabi George. The two candidates focused their arguments around... South Boston helped Anissa Asabi George secure the second spot in the Boston mayoral election. Despite Michelle Wu's strong lead in tonight's election, a recent Emerson poll has Michelle Wu winning this mayoral election by over 30 points. And this is one of the areas that helped her win in the primary. Of course, we can never know the true results until later tonight when the election results come in. But it will be exciting to find out. In the primary election, Michelle Wu dominated in liberal-leaning precincts, including Chinatown, Austin Brighton, Jamaica Plain, Beacon Hill, and the Back Bay, and the South End. Anissa Asabi George, a Dorchester native, won with 49% of the vote in South Boston. I think that they recognize a lot in her um, as someone who's from the area in particular, um, and probably uh, thought that she might represent them. Asabi George's base in South Boston and parts of Dorchester appeals to historically white conservative voters. Certain residents... Youth involvement has skyrocketed for this year's mayoral election, and that has not been unnoticed by the two mayoral candidates, Anissa Asabi George and Michelle Wu. This past Wednesday, we held a press conference for college journalists and college students alike, and today, the two candidates will be participating in a student forum at Boston University. Students from varying colleges and universities attended the forum. I spoke with them about their involvement in this election and what it means to them. Yeah, so my name is Kwame Chan. Um, I'm using Siri pronouns. 
been involved with the Boston Interpolated Student Government over the past summer, and we've been working on trying to get the video. Boston Bureau candidates in you know, the same place and trying to have a conversation with them. I am here personally just because I have a huge interest in learning about the ins and outs of the Boston City Council and the Boston Bureau. So, uh, My name is Jihad Anisha, that's J A H A N, space A Y E S H A N. Well, so for this one specifically, uh, it's the Boston Collegiate Government, and I am the executive president of Emerson's student government, as well as one of two voting members. So we were invited uh, to be a part of the CMB election this year and how it came out. Have you seen um, an influence of youth involvement? So actually, interestingly, this morning I was talking to Jim Hockey as in the Tampa 5, and he was giving me some statistics on the turnout for the uh, presidential elections this past November and at Emerson, we actually had a pretty good turnout. I think that 80-something percent of people who registered, who are eligible to register, did register, and then 70 percent of that um, actually went on vote. I think part of that is because a lot of us had a stake in that presidential election, whereas with the mayoral elections, it feels less so. While some students feel like there is not enough youth involvement in the mayoral election, others are optimistic about the peaked interest in politics among their peers. I would say there is considerably a lot of attention now, um, just the course of politics, you know, with the previous election as well. Like, people are more aware now about their rights and rights and why they need to vote and why they need to choose their right candidates. And I also feel like this is a very historic election because this is the first time there is a white man who's going to be the finest at the Boston elections. And change is inevitable, and this is definitely one of the changes in the right direction. There are 428,000 people registered to vote in Boston. But when the polls close at 8 today, Secretary of the Commonwealth William Galvin expects that 135,000 people will have voted. Polls opened at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. Around Boston, a low voter turnout is expected. Despite this being a historical election for the city, 108,000 voters cast the ballots in the preliminary elections in September. But Galvin's estimate that in Galvin's estimates is a 25% increase in voters. 142,000 people voted in the election for former Mayor Marty Walsh. It, it, it's a historic night for the city of Boston, and polls just closed at 8 p.m. As you grab the New York Times reports that Michelle Wu has received over... Okay, sorry. Um, now we're going to go to Elena Nays for more on what the polls are saying about this year's mayoral election. Thanks, Kerrigan. Thanks, Kerrigan. It is a historic night for Boston, and polls just closed at 8 p.m. The New York Times reports that Michelle Wu has received over 10,000 votes, which is 60.4% of the vote. As we wait for more results, I want to share a little bit about how the night might unfold. What we're getting right now does not include early voting or vote by mail or absentee ballots that were sent to City Hall later in the day. Those will be counted after the precincts have been reported back. This likely won't happen until after 10 p.m. tonight. As a reminder, early voting lasted from Saturday, October 23rd to Friday, October 29th. Reporters say that nearly 40,000 votes were already cast in early voting. And Secretary of State William Galvin said as of yesterday morning, there was more than 40,000 mail-in ballots already sent in. This election is potentially one of the lowest turnouts in Boston history. So with those votes not coming in until later, we may be watching the polls for a while. That's what I have for you right now. Back to you. Thanks, Elena. Each candidate is connected to Boston in different ways. Rianne Nelson tells us more about how, how their roots are having an impact on different voters. WEBN met with Thomas Mannion, campaign field organizer for potential mayor Anissa Sabi George, to learn more about how the campaign has been organizing canvassing during this crucial time. It's been to hit every neighborhood of the city of Boston every week. Uh, so I'm a field organizer for South Boston and Dorchester. And um, we would have a certain day of the week, seven days a week, um, where we would hit a, a neighborhood. So I would do Southie Sundays. I would do Dorchester on Thursdays. We would do West Roxbury on like Mondays, for example, Hyde Park on Tuesdays. And uh, so we just try to hit every region of the city at least once a week. 
um, this operation, um, what we have going on today, we have 30 packets of uh, lit each. Um, we try to look at the lit number of how many doors we're going to be knocking. Um, so primarily on these tables today is all of Dorchester, all of South Boston, and all of uh, Roxbury. Um, and this is just one of the staging locations that we have. Um, we have eight across the city this week. So um, our goal is to do the whole city twice between uh, today, tomorrow, and Monday before Election Day. And then Election Day, we're going to do it all again. Mannion also explains how he and his volunteers continue to stay motivated and why he believes Anissa Sabi George should be Boston's mayor. Me, I've lived in Georgia my entire life, so I've always lived in the city. So, you know, what happens affects me and I, you know, want to continue to live here. So that's how I stay motivated. Um, I've always been civically involved. And each, each volunteer has a different reason, whether um, certain issues important to them, if it's education, if it's public safety. Uh, if it's the MBTA. Um, so I always try to talk to people, figure out what they're, um, what's important to them. And then I stress why I think Anissa is going to be the best for me. Uh, when it comes to school, she's a former teacher. Uh, so with 13 years of experience in the classroom, she wants to make not just three schools in the Boston Public Schools good, but all 180. Um, and, you know, if it comes to public safety, she uh, wants to, you know, have good community relations with the police department and citizens. Um, she's not for defunding, um, but she is for, um, you know, making sure police officers know their residents and the residents know them and feel comfortable with them. Um, so she's open to like reforms and stuff, but uh, so far, uh, you know, she's always had a good relationship. She's open pretty much every neighborhood she's in, like she knows someone and she's just one of those people, even as a candidate, uh, people would go, uh, even before she was in public office, she'd always be helping people. Despite the hurdles, Manian maintains a positive outlook as COVID restrictions have loosened, allowing him and his volunteers to get back out there. It's truly been a unique experience, especially with the new rules and stuff. At first, when we first started, we were working virtually. So it was pretty much a lot of phone calls. Um, you'd be working from your house or you'd be in the field office, but you wouldn't be going out to knocking. Uh, once restrictions got lifted and people would, so we'd still wear masks and stuff when we were doing knocking and talking to people. Um, but now, you know, we, we just were out there, you know, so <laughs> we're out in the streets, we're on the phone calls, uh, we're trying to double hit people on the phones and at the doors. So, uh, it's, it's been unique, but we've overcome it. Yeah. Coming up after the break, we look back on the two candidates on their campaign trail and hear from the head of Emerson College Polling. During high school, I hung with the wrong crowd, and I never graduated. I helped Santiago in many different ways, like all fathers do, because he always wanted to go to college. I felt a little embarrassed to come back to school, but eventually, once I came here, I knew that it's for a bigger goal. He was very dedicated, hardworking. He connected with his teachers. He connected with other students. That was one of the key reasons why he was able to keep forging ahead. It was amazing to see him graduate. This was one thing that meant so much to him. And of course, it meant so much to us too. With the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed. That support is everything. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Julie was always a voracious reader. She'd carry two novels on an airplane because she'd read one on a three, four hour ride. And at some point, I began to notice that she would read a page and couldn't remember what she had just read, and she'd have to go back and read it again. I don't remember much these days after I read, but less does for me, and I love it. Oh, look, a redhead. <gasps> Staring contest. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. 
Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Welcome back to WEBN. Let's take a look at our candidates. Counselor Anissa Isabi George faced off against opponent Michelle Wu Monday night in the third mayoral debate. The debate served as Asabi George's final opportunity to appeal to undecided voters. She contested Wu's plans for a free MBTA system and rent control. She challenged Wu for her lack of understanding about the public health crisis in the Mass and Cass neighborhood of Boston. Acting Mayor Kim Janney recently declared drug addiction and homelessness a public health crisis in the neighborhood. City officials have started to remove the tent encampment in the intersection. If elected, Asabi George plans to allocate $30 million in federal funds to the crisis. She plans on appointing a high-level official to carry out the plans. Her plan focuses on addiction recovery, mental health treatment, and housing solutions for those in the neighborhood. Asabi George also reaffirmed her support for the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for city employees. She mentioned her plan to invest a significant amount of money to further help small businesses through the pandemic. Concerning housing, Asabi George criticized Wu's call for rent control, rather encouraging the elevation of first-time home buyers. When asked if her husband's Boston real estate agency would create a conflict of interest, Asabi George promised he would conduct no new dealings in the city. A recent poll shows Asabi George has a lot of ground to make up. A recent Suffolk University Boston mayoral poll showed Asabi George with 30% support compared to Wu's nearly 70%. Team Anissa for Boston will be hosting opportunities for canvassing, phone banking, and volunteering in the coming days before the election. Let's take a look at our live reporter. Now we go to Faith Pinal for more on the debates and what the road to election looked like for both candidates. Party is not open to Rather, the party is designed to be a private night for Councillor Anissa Sabi George to spend time with close friends, family, and supporters. Nicole Caravella, communications director for Team Anissa, says the counselor will be taking the night to rest, for it has been a long day. Back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Molly. Now we're going to Faith Pinal for more on the debates and what the road to the election night looked like for both candidates. The election trail sure is heating up right now with just a week left before Boston chooses their next mayor. Early voting is well underway, and this week, Michelle Wu's team is working to get Bostonians excited to cast their ballots. Wu has been focused on driving up voter turnout after low numbers in last month's preliminary elections. At a kickoff event on Saturday at the Boston Public Library, Wu had the chance to connect with voters. She was joined in Back Bay early, at the early voting site by Senator Elizabeth Warren. An avid supporter of Wu, Warren echoed the campaign's calls for change. Early voting ends October 29th. Until then, the Wu team gears up for a week of door knocking as they hope to engage eligible voters. Following a weekend of campaigning, Wu hit the debate stage on Monday night. She squared up against opponent Anissa Asabi George. The two candidates focused their arguments around transportation and rent control. Wu continued her push for free public transportation. She also expanded on her plan to rebuild the Long Island Bridge. Asabi George disagreed with Wu's alternative ferry idea. However, both women are eager to solve the problem currently affecting Mass and Cass area. As the historic race comes to a finish, the latest polling shows Wu leading by 32 points. With still a week left, this election is one to watch. I'll check in with you next week on WEBN to talk all things Michelle Wu. Until then, back to you and Kerrigan and Annie in the studio. Now we are going live to Faith, who is at the Wu election night party. Faith, what do you have for us? Hi, Kerrigan and Annie. Hi, Kerrigan and Annie. We are still here at the Wu election party and it is bumping. Guests have been arriving here since 8 p.m. and they're still funneling in as we speak. We're waiting till the top of the hour when we're told Wu is supposed to arrive 
until then, people are dancing, people are mingling. There's a lot of fun activities happening here. And with the votes only 16% in, we know we have a long and entertaining night ahead of us. We'll make sure to keep you posted. Back to you in the studio. Thank you so much. Callie Crosen has more about housing rates in Boston and how the candidates feel about it. A report by Zumper has shown that over the last month, the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment has increased by 5%. Redlining and exclusionary zoning practices have resulted in disproportionately high rates of housing instability in communities of color around Boston. Here, the difference in life expectancy in Back Bay is 30 years higher than it is in Roxbury. As mayor, I'm committed to not just creating more affordability across our rental market, but also creating some real opportunities for home ownership, especially on the affordable end. Because we know for families, especially those that have been here for generations, they've never, they've only always been renters and they've never owned sort of the land in which they live on. And we think about how that's rooted in our country's history, but in particular for our communities of color, we've got to create those pathways to ownership. Wu has plans to use the city resources to find more affordability. Boston is one of the wealthiest cities in the country, but one of the most unequal. The ability to have one person direct, I'm gonna not let this happen there, or I'm gonna only let this person do that there, um, has led to Force in a strong mayor system, but it has exacerbated almost every inequity that we can describe. Boston's next mayor will be tasked with addressing the increasing rents and homelessness as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. I'm Callie Rosen for WEBN, reporting from downtown Boston. Sydney Cohen has more about police reform and how the two candidates' views differentiate. Defunding and reforming the police has been a hot topic in the recent mayoral election. Michelle Wu and Asabi George have different policies when it comes to this matter. 36-year-old mayoral candidate Michelle Wu is running neck and neck against opposing candidate Anissa Asabi George. The two candidates have very similar platforms as they are both Democrats, except for when it comes to public safety and the structure of the Boston Police Department. Wu plans on rebuilding the department. She feels that if the city invests in neighborhoods and is more strict on disciplining officers due to racially motivated misconduct, it could benefit the city of Boston. I definitely think um, it reforming is very necessary and, you know, putting funds towards different parts of it and putting police through more training than what has been in the past. Wu believes that it's not entirely about the police officers, but rather the overall system and that it is time for structural changes in order to dismantle systemic racism. There's a clear choice in this race, and I'm fighting for the deep reforms around transparency and accountability that we need to have our crisis response reflect the need for public health and addressing mental illness separately from a response that involves armed law enforcement. Wu envisions a future that diverts nonviolent 911 calls towards other essential services that will provide a better, more efficient system of protection instead of the police. Asabi George's supporters feel strongly about this issue and that rather than defunding the police, the government should increase funding to support and work alongside the city's officers. Defunding the police does not make sense. Mm -hmm. You see, when you, when you have problems in the department, you need more funding to educate the officers, etc., etc. Although both candidates want a safer city for Boston residents, Asabi George wants to increase BPD financial support, whereas Wu wants to reallocate funds to restore justice into the system. Regardless of who is elected mayor, the Boston Police Department will face significant changes. For WEBN, this is Sydney Cohen. Now we go to Amrit Panu and her interview with the head of Emerson College Polling, Spencer Kimball. So can you kind of explain how polling works? Uh, the way uh, uh, survey research works is that we get uh, the entire population and we reach into that population and talk to a sample of people. And from that sample of people, it represents the entire population. So we can take their information and extrapolate from 500 people the way 500,000 people are going to behave. And uh, it's through that probability process of sampling that we can have representative samples and be able to project out some activities that people are going to behave in. Does it change over like the amount of space that the polling is done over? Like, 
for the U.S. election, it's done over the entirety of the United States versus for Boston. It's just the city of Boston. So if we think about sampling and sampling methods, if I was to go to a restaurant and try a bowl of soup, I don't need to drink the entire bowl of soup, even if it was made in a giant cauldron of soup. Let's say it was 500 gallons of soup. I don't need to drink proportionately a certain sample size. I just need you know, a teaspoon and I can get a pretty good idea and I can make a small bowl of soup and also get that idea. Well, in when we look at population and universes in the United States, there's 300 million adults over 18, uh, roughly living in the United States. And yet my sampling methods work the same as if I was just sampling the city of Boston with a population of 600,000 people, or if I was just sampling a town or a district in, in an area. Um, so generally speaking, once you hit 20,000 people, then your sampling methods all stay the same. And if we just think about on uh, a simpler form, think about our COVID-19 vaccines. If you weigh 70 pounds or 250 pounds, you're still getting the same amount of the vaccine. So once we hit a certain threshold and in sampling methods, it's a universe of 20,000 people, then the sampling methods stay the same, regardless if it's 200,000 people or 200 million. And how have these election polls been reflected? How has the election like, seen the polls been reflected in the election so far? Sorry. Well, it's always important that remember uh, surveys and polls are painted with a broad stroke. We're not a precise instrument. So when you see a survey that says 55, 45, it's not actually a 10 point spread, but it's a range of scores and it needs to be interpreted based on that range of scores. And that way we don't have some of these election surprises that um, we've seen in the past couple of presidential years. And uh, as long as we're looking at that, uh, what we saw in the primary here in Boston kind of went exactly as the polling suggested. Uh, we had Michelle Wu was polling very strongly in the mid 30s. She ended up around 33, 34 percent. It looked like Asabi George was going to get that second place finish because uh, Janie and Campbell were battling for the minority vote, the black vote in some of Boston, and they were splitting it. And so without one of them being the uh, the leader there, the polling kind of brought us to the reality of what was going to happen. Um, the polling suggested that John Barros was going to do very poorly, and he did. Uh, so there's aspects of it that work. My biggest concern with polling is that people take it too precise, and it's there to show us trends. So, for example, in this current poll, we're seeing a trend as far as what's going to happen tonight. Uh, but what we shouldn't be trying to do is give you an exact score or exact vote, because that's not what a survey really can do. And what are the trends showing for tonight? <laughs> I thought you might ask. So uh, when we think about tonight, uh, what we're seeing in the mayor's race is uh, Michelle Wu, who, had, who won the primary by about 11 points. She's been able to extend her support, it looks like. Um, she's in a very strong position. We have her up about 28 points, could be as high as 30. But remember, there's a range of scores. So it could also be as low as like 22, 23 points. Now, uh, this polling was done prior to these last bits of ads that were released over the weekend. So it's important to see uh, there was a lot of negative advertising coming out over the weekend. And that usually has an impact on, on attitudes. So these polls all happened prior to that. Um, and prior to that, I would argue that uh, Wu was in a very strong position to get elected. Um, I still think she is in a very strong position. The question is just going to be by how much. Um, so a poll, of course, runs with that margin of error. So there's a range of scores. And we have a 95% confidence level that it's going to fall within that range of scores. And so with all of that being said, we would expect to see Wu win by double digits tonight. That would be what the trends are suggesting. Are there any particular districts she's stronger in than others? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's definitely uh, regional support. So like South Boston, uh, that's going to be a real strong area for Asabi George. But if we get into Alston Brighton, that's going to be a really strong area for Michelle Wu. Um, if we get into really Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, Mission Hill, uh, Mattapan, those should all be very strong areas for Wu. And when I say strong, she should be winning those like 75, 25. Uh, you're going to get into some areas like Dorchester. That's going to be where um, Asabi George is able to make 
pretty much her last stand is going to be between Dorchester and West Roxbury. And we'll have to see if she's able to win those areas like 90 to 10. She's going to have to really dominate and have very strong turnouts in those two areas to be able to compete. Um, with that said, she's trailing so badly in these other areas that it'll be interesting to see if there's sometimes like a wave that comes during an election. So even though that there's pockets where she's strong, when that wave comes, there's not much you can do about it. Um, and we've seen that in like presidential years. If you remember 2016, that was like a wave where states that you thought Trump would win, he won by even more than you expected. That wave occurs on election day. And that's what we're waiting to see if um, we get that type of result. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Of course. Have a great day. Coming up next, more from our reporters on the candidates' views. And the plans after inauguration. We'll be right back. During high school, I hung with the wrong crowd and I never graduated. I helped Santiago in many different ways, like all fathers do, because he always wanted to go to college. I felt a little embarrassed to come back to school, but eventually once I came here, I knew that it's for a bigger goal. He was very dedicated, hardworking. He connected with his teachers. He connected with other students. That was one of the key reasons why he was able to keep forging ahead. It was amazing to see him graduate. This was one thing that meant so much to him. And of course, it meant so much to us too. With the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed. That support is everything. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Julie was always a, a voracious reader. She carried two novels on an airplane because she'd read one on a three, four hour ride. And at some point I began to notice that she would read a page and couldn't remember what she had just read and she'd have to go back and read it again. I don't remember much these days after I read, but less does for me and I love it. Oh, look, a redhead. <gasps> Staring contest. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Welcome back to this special episode of WEBN Political Polls. We're continuing, we're continuing with our live coverage of this year's Boston mayoral election. Next, we go to live reporter Faith Pinal once again for an update on Michelle Wu. Thanks again, Kerrigan and Annie. I am still here and we are still going very strong at the party. Everybody says we should be responsible expecting Wu to be out on the stage within 10 or 15 minutes and we will keep you posted on everything that goes down here. Guests are expecting that she is going to be having an acceptance speech tonight and we're already hearing cheers from all of the fans that are here. People are still filing in so we'll see you soon. Back to you in the studio. Anthony Labruto has more on the way this election's changing history with the first elected woman of color for mayor in Boston. For the first time in its history, Boston will elect a woman of color to the mayor's office. This race has proven to be a historic one, with people across the city anxiously awaiting voting day. For me, it's uh, kind of a big change since it goes from many generations of men being mayors and to have actually two finalists being women. It's kind of iconic. When asked why it was so important that Boston elects a more diverse group of people, Boston resident Alden Jones said, We'll give our, our children uh, a chance to see some future and, and, and their hopes and dreams that if, if somebody else can do it, then maybe I can do it and we can all, you know, and eventually there will be equality, hopefully. Since 1822, when Boston officially created the mayor position, it has been held by white men. Kim Janey was Boston's first woman of color to hold the mayoral seat, and she replaced former mayor Marty Walsh. Regardless of who wins tonight, Wu or Sabi George will be Boston's first elected woman of color mayor. Erin Ogilneck, 
Emerson College professor and CEO of 27 South Strategies, share with us why he thinks it's taken the city so long to break the precedent. What we have is we have uh, a city that is is uh, segregated by the way people live. And there are very uh, tight voting patterns about who people are voting for. So what has happened, at least over the course of the last 20 or so years, is that there have been different candidates who come from different parts of the city with very strong bases. And candidates of color have, have sadly canceled each other out. No matter tonight's results, the people of Boston are excited about this historic election and history-breaking candidates. I'm Anthony Labruto, reporting for WEBN. Mayor Kim Janey has made history as the first black and first woman to serve in the acting mayor position. As the city prepares to elect a new mayor, we reflect on Kim Janey's accomplishments over the past seven months. In October, Janey unveiled a plan to address the mass and caste situation and declared substance use disorder and unsheltered homelessness a public health crisis. She issued an executive order to create a central coordinating team of city and state partners to find shelter and treatment options. The coordinating team met the morning she spoke about this new plan. Janie also declared every second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day through an executive order she signed early last month. The mayor notes the city of Boston is committed to recognizing Indigenous history, celebrating cultures, strengthening relationships, and increasing dialogue with local tribes. Now an update from live reporter Molly Doherty. Anissa Savvy George hit the clothes early this morning with her children. She wouldn't let her kids be late to school. As the day progressed, Savvy George visited multiple polling locations throughout Boston. She spoke with voters and supporters. While Savvy George has yet to enter the party, close friends, family members, and supporters have been filtering in as the polls close and as the results come rolling in. Back to you in the studio. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts is provided free bike rides on election day in order to make voting more accessible. Free bike rides will be available in 11 cities of the Boston metropolitan area, including Boston, Cambridge, Newton, and Somerville. Voters can also find the closest polling location through the Blue Bikes app. Jeff Bellows, Vice President of Corporate Citizenship and Public Affairs at Blue Cross, said that they're proud of removing transportation barriers and helping citizens exercise their right to vote. Now we go back to Elena Nays in the M Suite. Elena. Thanks, Kerrigan. Approximately 16% of precincts are reporting results right now, and Wu is leading with about 4,000 votes. That means she's leading with 58.4% of the votes. We'll see if more votes come in from South Boston, where Asabi George is from, and see if she can shrink that gap. As a reminder, this does not reflect the early voting numbers and mail-in ballots, which will be counted later after all the precincts come in. We only have around 20,000 votes counted so far, so we still have a long way to go. Asabi George has yet to concede, but if she does, we will keep you updated. That's what I have for you. Back to you at the desk. Oh, yeah. The two mayoral candidates, Michelle Wu and Anissa Sabi George, met with acting Mayor Kim Janey to discuss when the transfer of power would take place. They all agreed that the next mayor of Boston will be inaugurated on November 16th, only two weeks after Election Day. This time period is considerably shorter than the period of transition between previous administrations. After Election Day, each candidate has 10 days to request a recount, and election results cannot be certified during this period. But if none of the candidates request a recount, the results should be certified one day before the winner is inaugurated. Now we're going to break. Play. Thank you for joining us, and we will be right back. During high school, I hung with the wrong crowd, and I never graduated. I helped Santiago in many different ways, like all fathers do, because he always wanted to go to college. I felt a little embarrassed to come back to school, but eventually, once I came here, I knew that it's for a bigger goal. He was very dedicated, hardworking. He connected with his teachers. He connected with other students. That was one of the key reasons why he was able to keep forging ahead. It was amazing to see him graduate. This was one thing that meant so much to him, and of course, it meant so much to us, too. 
with the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed. That support is everything. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Julie was always a, a voracious reader. She carried two novels on an airplane because she'd read one on a three, four hour ride. And at some point, I began to notice that she would read a page and couldn't remember what she had just read, and she'd have to go back and read it again. I don't remember much these days after I read, but less does for me, and I love it. Oh, look, a redhead. <gasps> Staring contest! You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Sometimes the things we do or say can make others feel hurt, excluded, or isolated. Everything you say and do creates an impact. How am I supposed to save the whole world? You can't think about saving the world. You have to think about saving one person. Because of you, someone's entire life can change. You don't have to be a superhero to have a positive impact. Friends? Friends. We live in a world full of fast-moving wheels and feet. From navigating the city on foot, to bicycling on a busy street, or crossing multiple lanes of traffic, we need to be more aware of all that is happening around us. Always be careful when approaching a crosswalk. Someone may be crossing. Scan the street and check your mirrors before opening your car door. And stop, look, and listen when entering intersections. So next time, and every time, scan the street for wheels and feet. You can achieve a lot using your imagination. I mean, I don't like to brag, but... Wait, who's that? And why is she all over these achievement awards? But with STEM, the sky's the limit. Shaboom! Use STEM to envision... Okay, I'm seeing it. Yeah! Invent... Got any ideas? I've got a few, actually. And create a better world. Told you she's super smart. If she can STEM, so can you. Find out more at She Can STEM. They call me Maxi, but I prefer Tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Me and my boy Matt had it good. He had catnip that was off the hook. But one day, he brings a girl home, and she's allergic to cats. Every sneeze was a nail in my coffin. Now I'm in a shelter. It's decent, but they don't even have Wi-Fi. Hey guys, how are you today? Good. I'm here to talk about how with technology you can make amazing worlds. Come with me. My team and I bring the Halo world to life. Is that you? That is me. 
I wasn't a math genius and I knew nothing about coding, but you guys do. You guys have the power to change things. I want your job. I want you to have my job. Welcome back. Results are coming in quickly. Let's check in with Elena, who is watching the numbers. Thanks. So we're still sitting at Wu with a 58.4% lead. The polls haven't really been updated in about 20 minutes. We haven't seen any new data coming in. But as we're following through the night, we will keep coming back to this and we will keep coming back. So that's all I have. Thank you. Wu spent the day campaigning with her family. She visited. She visited several polling places and used social media to let people know where she was. Wu has been leading in the polls for several weeks and hopes to be to head to the corner office. Let's head over to Faith, who is at the campaign party. Faith, how is the mood? All right, guys, we are over here still at the campaign party. The party is not cooling down anytime soon, and with nearly 16% of the votes being tallied so far, according to the New York Times poll, we have Wu in the lead right now. Spirits are very high, and they continue to be up. People are anxiously awaiting. We haven't heard any word of Wu being in the building yet, but we are sure she's going to come. As you guys know, she has had a busy day canvassing and campaigning. Her work is not done, and she worked up until the very last second that the polls closed. So right now, we're sure she's getting some well-deserved rest before she comes here to get what everybody's anticipating is going to be an acceptance speech. We'll continue to keep you guys posted. It might be a long night and we will be here every step of the way. Back to you, Kerrigan and Annie in the studio. Thank you, Faith. It sure looks crowded there. There is some speculation Wu could take the stage soon and we'll be waiting for that. But for right now, let's check in with Molly at Anissa Asabi George's headquarters. There is a sea of pink behind me as more and more Anissa and Asabi George supporters, friends, and family members come rolling in. Asabi George has yet to arrive, but supporters will continue to eat, drink, listen to music, delivery, and discuss as results come rolling in. Back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Molly. Now we're going to talk to Callie Krausen about housing rates in Boston, how the candidates feel about it. A report by Zumper has shown that over the last month, the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment has increased by 5%. Redlining and exclusionary zoning practices have resulted in disproportionately high rates of housing instability in communities of color around Boston. Here, the difference in life expectancy in Back Bay is 30 years higher than it is in Roxbury. As mayor, I'm committed to not just creating more affordability across our rental market, but also creating some real opportunities for home ownership, especially on the affordable end. Because we know for families, especially those that have been here for generations, they've never, they've only always been renters and they've never owned sort of the land in which they live on. And we think about how that's rooted in our country's history. But in particular for our communities of color, we've got to create those pathways to ownership. Wu has plans to use the city resources to find more affordability. Boston is one of the wealthiest cities in the country, but one of the most unequal. The ability to have one person direct, I'm going to not let this happen there, or I'm going to only let this person do that there, um, has led to force in a strong mayor system, but it has exacerbated almost every inequity that we can Boston's next mayor will be tasked with addressing the increasing rents and homelessness as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. I'm Callie Croson for WEBN, reporting from downtown Boston. Each candidate is connected to Boston in different ways. Rian Nelson tells us more about how their roots are having an impact on different voters. WEBN met with Thomas Mannion, campaign field organizer for potential mayor Anissa Sabi George, to learn more about how the campaign has been organizing canvassing during this crucial time. It's been to hit every neighborhood of the city of Boston every week. Uh, so I'm a field organizer for South Boston and Dorchester. And um, 
we would have a certain day of the week, seven days a week, um, where we would hit a, a neighborhood. So I would do Southie Sundays. I would do Dorchester on Thursdays. We would do West Roxbury on Mondays, for example, Hyde Park on Tuesdays. And uh, so we just try to hit every region of the city at least once a week. Um, this operation, um, what we have going on today, we have 30 packets uh, of lit each. Um, we try to look at the lit number of how many doors we're going to be knocking. Um, so primarily on these tables today is all of Dorchester, all of South Boston, and all of uh, uh, Roxbury. Um, and this is just one of the staging locations that we have. Um, we have eight across the city this week. So um, our goal is to do the whole city twice between uh, today, tomorrow, and Monday before Election Day. And then Election Day, we're going to do it all again. Mannion also explains how he and his volunteers continue to stay motivated and why he believes Anissa Sabi George should be Boston's mayor. Me, I've lived in Georgia my entire life, so I've always lived in the city. So, you know, what happens affects me and I, you know, want to continue to live here. So that's how I stay motivated. Um, I've always been civically involved. And each, each volunteer has a different reason, whether um, certain issues important to them, if it's education, if it's public safety. Uh, if it's the MBTA. Um, so I always try to talk to people, figure out what they're, um, what's important to them. And then I stress why I think Anissa is going to be the best for you. Uh, when it comes to school, she's a former teacher. Uh, so with 13 years of experience in the classroom, she wants to make not just three schools in the Boston Public Schools good, but all 180. Um, and, you know, if it comes to public safety, she um, wants to, you know, have good community relations with the police department and citizens. Um, she's not for defunding, um, but she is for, um, you know, making sure police officers know their residents and the residents know them and feel comfortable with them. Um, so she's open to like reforms and stuff, but uh, so far, um, you know, she's always had a good relationship. She's open pretty much every neighborhood she's in, like she knows someone and she's just one of those people, even as a candidate, um, people would go, uh, even before she was in public office, she'd always be helping people. Despite the hurdles, Manion maintains a positive outlook as COVID restrictions have loosened, allowing him and his volunteers to get back out there. It's truly been a unique experience, especially with the new rules and stuff. At first, when we first started, we were working virtually, so it was pretty much a lot of phone calls. Um, you'd be working from your house, or you'd be in the field office, but you wouldn't be going out door knocking. Uh, once restrictions got lifted, and people would, you know, we'd still wear masks and stuff when we were doing off and talking to people. Um, but now, you know, we, we just were out there, you know, so <laughs> we're out in the streets, we're on the phone calls, uh, we're trying to double hit people on the phones and at the door. So, uh, it's, it's been unique, but we've overcome it. Yeah. Well, we're still waiting for the new mayor to be elected. I think that we should kind of talk about how this is a historically low turnout for, voter turnouts. I feel like that that's something that we should talk about, especially this since this is a historic event with both candidates running. So, right. I mean, this is the first time that we've had predominantly and uh, predominantly women of color candidates in a Boston mayoral election. And yet we have historically low voter turnout. And I wonder if there is a correlation with that, if, um, you know, some of that internalized and pervasive racism and sexism that we do see within Boston is having an impact, or if it's because of any of the other factors that are going on in American politics right now, be it COVID, um, unexpected voter turnout that might show up, like we saw in the 2020 presidential election. And like we saw that there's, um, well, the Secretary of State said there's about 48,000 mail-in ballots that have already arrived. And that makes it super hard to estimate what kind of voter turnout we're looking at with that, you know? Yeah, I also think that's why the numbers are taking so long to be counted tonight yes. is because they have a lot of voting coming from all sorts of places and even the turnout is lower than expected. I feel like we still have a long way to go for the counting of polls. And either way, it's gonna be historic night in general. We're gonna come out of this with the first woman of color elected in Boston. I think that's a major thing mm -hmm. that, even though a lot of people know about it, if they've been following the mayoral race, that I just wanted to reestate again, because that is something that is crazy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the value of that cannot be understated. I mean, it's definitely right. There's ballots coming from all over the town, all over the city, all over all the different neighborhoods. And yet it's still 30 minutes for an update on election night was such a historically 
uh, important election is definitely surprising. And I'm sure voters, especially those who have been really active in this election are really frustrated right now. But honestly, like, I could kind of feel that the the vibes were a little bit different today. You know, when being in other elections and walking through the town, you kind of feel this like energy. Um, but even just walking to downtown crossing and back to Back Bay today, I didn't see any voting signs. I didn't see any I voted stickers. For anyone, it would seem like a normal Tuesday if you didn't know what was going on, which again is just shocking to me, especially because in my circle within our generation, we're seeing so much engagement in these elections, especially when such representation is at stake here. Um, and I guess, you know, Republicans have higher voter turnout than Democrats consistently. And this is, these are two Democratic candidates. And also, um, I think that's having an impact as well, is why maybe from my perspective, it seems like this is such an election that people are enthusiastic about, but the numbers are not supporting that perspective. I think that both with Michelle Wu and Anissa Sabi George, there hasn't been a solid divide between the two candidates, yeah. which is maybe why we've seen a lot of differentiating views and why the debates ended up being so controversial at some points because they really wanted to make themselves stand out with the other. Yeah, I mean, Michelle Wu was one of the first candidates to announce her candidacy for this election. And then I remember when Andrea Campbell announced a few weeks after, all anyone could talk about is what sets you two apart, which is an important political question, but it's also something that we see asked a lot more frequently when it's women and especially women of color who are running against each other. It's people always trying to divide them and also always trying to wrap their heads around how two women of color could have different political views and things like that. Um, but as partisan lines are becoming a lot more rigid within different stances, it's going to be interesting to see how different candidates take a stance. And we see this a lot with this mass and casting that's going on right now with the homeless, homelessness crisis being deemed a public health issue by Kim Janey and both Michelle Wu and Anissa Sabi George coming out in favor of it. Um, we're getting some new numbers in right now. Uh, Wu is at 48 and um, at 58, sorry, Wu is at 58% and Anissa Sabi George is at 41%. How much, do we know how much precincts reporting that is? That's uh, 51? 15% of uh, precincts reporting, we're at 58% for Wu and 41% for Anissa Sabi George. Um, and there's always that extra couple percent that takes in the write-ins for Mickey Mouse or Zac Efron or whoever your choice is. <laughs> and the numbers are just going to keep on coming. So uh, we have a little bit of time here to just kind of you know, wrap our heads around this night. We have our live reporters on standby to yeah. kind of get the rest of the information in. Right. But up until then, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to go to break and we'll be right back. Yeah, it's going to be a long night, Boston. We'll stay with you. During high school, I hung with the wrong crowd and I never graduated. I helped Santiago in many different ways, like all fathers do, because he always wanted to go to college. I felt a little embarrassed to come back to school, but eventually once I came here, I knew that it's for a bigger goal. He was very dedicated, hardworking. He connected with his teachers. He connected with other students. That was one of the key reasons why he was able to keep forging ahead. It was amazing to see him graduate. This was one thing that meant so much to him. And of course, it meant so much to us too. With the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed. That support is everything. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Julie was always a, a voracious reader. She carried two novels on an airplane because she'd read one on a three, four hour ride. And at some point I began to notice that she would read a page and couldn't remember what she had just read and she'd have to go back and read it again. I don't remember much these days after I read, but less does for me and I love it. Oh, look, a redhead <gasps> staring contest. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You're looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. 
You can achieve a lot using your imagination. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to brag, but... Wait, who's that? And why is she all over these achievement awards? But with STEM, the sky's the limit. Shaboom! Use STEM to envision. Okay, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Invent. Got any ideas? I've got a few, actually. And create a better world. Told you she's super smart. If she can STEM, so can you. Find out more at She Can STEM. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 30 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Honorary Forest Ranger Betty White here, lending a hand to my dear friend Smokey Bear. Because for 75 years, he's only said, Only you can prevent wildfires. But there's a lot more to say. Like, if you park your car on tall, dry grass, the hot exhaust pipe can start a wildfire. So keep the animals safe, especially the cute shirtless one. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter. But this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right. I said it. Because of you, I felt hopeless. Because you said rude things about my work, I started to question my own voice. I know it was a joke, but it still hurt me. Because of your negative comments online, I've almost quit doing the one thing that makes me happiest in life. Because you shared something about me that was private, I felt embarrassed. Because you said hi to me on the first day of school, I felt included, and I knew that I was going to be okay. Because of you sharing your story with me, I feel comfortable sharing my own. Because you were there when I was coming out, you helped me regain my confidence. I'm still here today because of you. During high school, I hung with the wrong crowd, and I never graduated. I helped Santiago in many different ways, like all fathers do, because he always wanted to go to college. I felt a little embarrassed to come back to school, but eventually, once I came here, I knew that it's for a bigger goal. He was very dedicated, hardworking. He connected with his teachers, he connected with other students. That was one of the key reasons why he was able to keep forging ahead. It was amazing to see him graduate. This was one thing that meant so much to him, and of course, it meant so much to us too. With the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed. That support is everything. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back to WEBN Boston special election coverage. We're going to go now to Faith at Michelle Wu's headquarters with some updates on the mood there. Faith, what do you got for us? All right, we are still here at the Wu party. Not much has changed in terms of results as we haven't had an update since 8.42 this evening. However, we are waiting patiently and we're seeing a lot of people coming in with lawn signs, Wu flyers. People have been out all day canvassing and we're finally starting to see them trickle into this party. Like we mentioned before, this party is all about bringing together Wu supporters, bringing her into the community with open arms as she hopefully takes home the acceptance this evening. We'll be keeping you posted all night long. Until then, stay tuned. Molly will have more results soon. She's at the Asabi George headquarters. 
and uh, we'll keep you posted as we find out more. Back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Faith. Now we're going to go to Molly, who is still at Anissa Sabi Georgia's headquarters. Molly, what do you have for us? Anissa Sabi Georgia's Twitter, Team Anissa has sent more than 100,000 text messages, knocked on almost 150,000 doors, and has made half a million phone calls. All of these attempts, especially those made this weekend, were meant to close the gap between Anissa Sabi Georgia and competitor Michelle Wu. Anticipation is building here at the party as attendees await Anissa Savi George's arrival and watch the results come rolling in. Back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Molly. Once again, while we're waiting for the poll numbers to make their way in tonight, I feel mm -hmm. like we still have a lot to talk about tonight, talk about this race, talk about what's happened here. Um, I think that we should also bring up endorsements because we were talking about earlier before the show about how endorsements were a big thing this election, especially because both candidates are Democratic and both have some similar stances on certain issues, some differentiating. But I feel like we can start right there and then go on with that. Right. Well, I think that the endorsements are both an advantage and a disadvantage, to be honest, because with Michelle Wu getting all these key endorsements from uh really progressive superstars like Warren and Markey and uh, the vote pro-choice and things like that. She's going to get a lot of support from the progressives. But since the anyone can vote in the mayoral election and there's only two Democratic candidates running, that's alienating herself from any Republican or moderates who might be willing to vote for a Democratic candidate. Whereas Anissa Sabi George, while she's not getting those key endorsements that will gain her support from progressives, she's also maybe appealing more to some of the middle ground by not having those uh, endorsements under her resume. You know what I mean? No, I completely agree. I think that the case that both candidates are democratic and both are having these certain views that have to kind of like differentiate themselves in a way that can kind of be seen as out there or stuff like that. I think that the endorsements do mean a lot, especially to Republican voters. Right. And I think with uh, some of this party lines that we've been talking about here, like with progressives and Democrats, just falling behind these kind of political superstars. Like I keep coming back to Warren, but I cannot express how valuable I think her endorsement's going to be for Wu in this race. Um, and that shot of them kind of lifting their hands up together at a Wu rally, that circulated all over democratic social media, it was all over Twitter, a huge impact on getting people out to vote. Um, and so I do think that there is a little bit of party loyalty involved in there. And so anyone who's supporting Wu or, or um, who's supporting Warren or supporting Mark, he is gonna go and support Wu as well. Um, but again, this historically low turnout could throw anything into, uh, anything's possible. And as we know from Boston politics especially, which have a reputation for being a little bit unpredictable, um, really there is anything that could happen. No, yeah, no, I agree. I think that as we're waiting for the numbers to come in, that's all we can do right now is just wait. So we'll be stepping away for a bit and we'll be back when more votes are counted. And thank you so much for joining us for this WEBN special episode. Oh, so we're going to toss now to Elena Nez, uh, who has some updates on the numbers, hopefully. Thanks, Kerrigan. Boston residents voted on three ballot questions in addition to the mayor and the city council race, which we don't have results for either of those just yet. The first question addressed whether the city should approve a charter amendment proposed to change the city's budget in several ways. Who will hold budgetary power is a major aspect of this charter. Under the proposed amendment is the city council would have the ability to amend the budget by reallocating funds among existing or new line items. A vote from this amendment would also require the city council and mayor to create an independent office of participatory budgeting. Question two addresses whether a high voltage electrical substation should be built in East Boston along Chelsea Creek near Holmes Park playground, jet fuel storage, and in the flood risk area. This would be instead of a nearby alternative location such as a non-residential Massport land at Logan Airport. Question three asks Boston residents whether the current appointed school committee structure should be changed to a school committee elected by residents of Boston. The appointed school committee has been in the practice since 1992. Advocates for an elected school committee frame th their position 
to the question of civil rights issues. Their aim is to end voter disenfranchisement and in communities of color whose children compromise about 85% of the 51,000 students in the Boston public schools. Their effort to dissolve the appointed school committee has attracted little opposition, according to the Boston Globe. But neither of the two mayor candidates supported the full, fully elected board City Council Michelle Wu said she favored a major, a majority elected and rest appointed. The City Councilor Anissa Zabi George preferred an appointed board. That's all I have for you. As we're waiting on the results, you'll check back in with me, but that's what I have for you now. Back to you. Well, it's been a long night, Boston. Our city councilor elections were also tonight, so if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and look at the local papers for those results. Uh, New York City also had an historic mayor election tonight. Um, so yeah, the numbers are still not coming in. I don't know what's going on there, but we'll be excited to hear the results tomorrow morning, I guess. Yes, thank you for tuning in to this special edition of WEBN Political Pulse. I'm Kerrigan Knowles. And I'm Annie Bennett. Have a great night. During high school, I hung with the wrong crowd and I never graduated. I helped Santiago in many different ways like all fathers do because he always wanted to go to college. I felt a little embarrassed to come back to school, but eventually once I came here, I knew that it's for a bigger goal. He was very dedicated, hardworking. He connected with his teachers, he connected with other students. That was one of the key reasons why he was able to keep forging ahead. It was amazing to see him graduate. This was one thing that meant so much to him, and of course, it meant so much to us too. With the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed. That support is everything. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org.